When the Buddha lists the Brahma Viharas, he notes that as you go up the list, if you use the different themes of the Brahma Viharas as a topic of meditation, as you go up the list, you get to higher and higher levels of concentration. Compassion leads to a higher level of concentration than goodwill. Perhaps because the desire to help those who are suffering or those who are creating the causes for suffering is a more uplifting emotion than the simple desire to see beings be happy. You open up your heart more to those who are suffering. And with that opening of the heart, there's a greater sense of joy, a greater sense of calm, well-being. It allows the mind to get a deeper concentration. Higher than compassion, though, is empathetic joy. And you might wonder, isn't it a higher thing to feel compassion for those who are suffering than to be happy for those who are happy? Well, it's more than just being happy for those who are happy. You think about the fact that they did something in order to gain that happiness. In fact, you're also happy for those who are creating the causes for happiness now. And there's a sense of joy in seeing that the teachings on karma really work. You do skillful things and there will be rewards. That's a somewhat more impersonal principle, but it lifts the mind to a higher state, because it's getting you out of the way. Because you think about what are the things that would interfere with empathetic joy, and they're all very childish attitudes. One is if you see someone who has something that you want, but you don't have, and you feel resentment, you feel jealousy, envy. And when you're able to overcome that, take yourself out of the picture, that heightens the concentration. The other cases are those where people have done things that lead to happiness. They've been skillful in the past, but they're not skillful anymore. In fact, they've taken the results of their skillful actions and they're abusing them. And you don't like it. You don't want to see them be happy. You feel they don't deserve that happiness. But when you think in the terms of the principle of karma, they did something someplace in the past that leads to that happiness. And even though they're spoiling the results, the fact that you're willing to accept the principle of karma, that act, good actions do lead to good results, it lifts the mind, but also gives rise to a sense of sangwega. You realize that you can do good things, and then somehow the mind changes. We see so many cases like this. People come into a position of power, people have wealth, people have beauty, people have strength. And they must have done something in the past for those things to come about. But now they let it go to their heads. People with power feel they're invincible. People with beauty feel they can get away with anything. People with strength can force their will on others. So it makes you realize that if you're going to be aiming for happiness, you don't want to content yourself with the happiness of the world. Because it's not safe. The only safe happiness is the, safe, the safety of the noble attainments.
And so as you develop empathetic joy in this way, it leads to a more mature attitude. as you accept the impersonality of the principle of karma. And also you come to admit the limitations of karma. As all the Buddha said, there are four kinds. Bright, in other words, you do good things and it'll lead to good rebirth. Dark, you do bad things, it'll lead to a bad rebirth. Mixed, bright and dark, you lead to a rebirth where there's pain mixed with pleasure, like the human realm. But then there's a fourth level of karma, karma that leads to the end of karma. That's the Noble Eightfold Path. And it's only when you see the limitations of even the best bright karma that you're willing to go for the Noble Path. And this is a pattern throughout the Buddha's teachings. His step-by-step -step discourse it starts with generosity, giving virtue, the virtue of restraint, and then the rewards of giving and virtue, the various heavenly realms that you can enjoy. But then he talks about the drawbacks of sensuality. He says the drawbacks of the degradation, because here you are just eating up the results of your old actions, and you're not producing anything good to, to replace them. So of course you're going to fall. This is a while back. It's like samsara is a sick joke. You work really hard to develop good qualities, and then you get the rewards for those good qualities, and they spoil you. Unless you devote them to the noble paths. So the next step in that step-by-step -step discourse. After you see the degradation of sensuality, you begin to think that maybe renunciation is a good thing. Renunciation here, of course, means not only just giving up sensual pleasures, but providing a better pleasure and to replace them, which is what we're doing as we, as we meditate. We're working on the pleasure of form. The body is its experience from within. We're making that as pleasant as possible. So to give the mind the food it needs in order to practice, to settle down and be still, and see things as they really are. See the movements of the mind as they're actually happening. To see the extent to which you're fabricating your experience. And then the value of those fabrications, which ones are useful, which ones are not. You see these things more clearly. I was doing a Zoom teaching this afternoon. And one of the questions was from one of the people saying, I've been meditating for many years, but I've never really looked into these jhanas. Do you think they really are that they really are necessary? And as I told the questioner, how are you going to see the processes of fabrication unless you get the mind really, really still? And you use the processes of fabrication to create that state of concentration. As someone once said, the things we know best are the things we do. And so you do concentration by taking form, feelings, perceptions, fabrications, and consciousness, and turning them into a state of concentration. That's how you really get to know them. If you don't use them like this, you don't know them. And if you don't know them, how can you gain insight into them. And of course, on top of that, when the mind is really still like this, you can see really subtle levels of fabrication you wouldn't have seen otherwise. And that's when the mind is ready for the Four Noble Truths. To see the extent to which you are creating stress where you don't have to. You work on getting dispassion for, this, for the stress, you abandon the cause, and the mind opens up to cessation. 
A cessation doesn't mean these things simply stop. But when they stop, there's an experience of the deathless. And when you hit that, that's when your happiness is safe. Up until this point, everything is unsafe. Even jhana is unsafe. You can develop a sense of pride around it. You can get complacent about it. There are periods when it comes really easily and you get lazy about it. And you can decide that you're satisfied, though, with that, that level of pleasure, and you stop right there. So there are dangers even in, in that, even in the concentration, that bless of concentration. It's when you've reached the deathless, though. You've had your first taste of the deathless, then you found something that's totally safe. So to reflect on empathetic joy, do precisely that, reflect. Remember the Buddha's image of the mirror that he, he taught to Rahula as he introduced the practice of a, as a whole. It started with the practice, <coughs> excuse me, started with the image of a mirror. You're going to be looking at yourself. When you see people doing good things that would lead to happiness, you see them enjoying the results of those good things. It inspires you to do good things as well. When you see people who are enjoying the results of their past good actions, but they're abusing them, it should inspire you to aspire to something higher, to happiness is really safe. And it's when you've reached that happiness that you know that you've used the contemplation of empathetic joy to its best purpose. Remember that all the teachings, all dhammas, have an, what the Buddha calls atta, a goal, a purpose. You don't just sit with them, you take them someplace. That was another question that came up. A woman had been meditating for many years, and she said she was afraid that she was becoming a hypocrite about her meditation. How? because she wanted results. That was craving, right? Isn't craving wrong? said, no. Desire is what motivates the path. It's simply a question of making sure that your desires are aimed at the right goal. And you use the Dharma to get to that goal. That's what it's for. So when you've used empathetic joy to the point where it opens the mind to something deathless. That's when you know that you've used this particular teaching, this particular practice, for its intended purpose. You've reaped the rewards. You've gained the benefits. And you realize that this is why the Buddha taught. And this is why he had that compassion to set out the religion, to establish the Dharma and the Vinaya. So that people, thousands of years afterwards, in another part of the world, could taste these benefits. This is why the experience of the deathless is, is accompanied by a sense of intense gratitude for the Buddha. Or what he did to find this happiness, and what he did to keep the path to this happiness open as long as it's been open. And John Swett said, when you've completed the path, as far as you're concerned, weeds could grow up in the path again. But then you look back and you see other people want to find the end of suffering as well. And so when you see other people putting stones and other obstacles in the path, you want to clear them away. Because you've seen that the atta of the Dhamma, when the Dhamma is practiced in accordance with the Dhamma, is so excellent. And 
and you want to do what you can to keep that opening, that possibility alive.